Hello everyone, I, Rishik Perugu, on behalf of Team Decoherence, welcome you all to this 10th lecture in Coherence Lecture Series organized by Team Decoherence as part of Pravega 21. Pravega is annual science cultural tech fest organized solely by undergraduates at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. In Coherence Lecture Series, we hear from renowned physicists who are actively involved in research in particular areas of physics so that everyone gets introduced to various areas in physics and ongoing research and research methodologies in those areas. Today, we are very delighted to have Professor Sunil Mukhi who has been kind enough to accept our invitation. Today's talk is titled Mathematical Physics and Reality, Two Worlds or One. Professor Sunil Mukhi is one of the leading high energy theorists in India working in the areas of string theory, quantum field theory and particle physics. He is currently a physics professor and dean of faculty at ISR Pune. After spending a couple of years as a postdoc at ICTP, Professor Mukhi moved to India where he worked at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research from 1984 before joining ISR Pune in 2012. His major publications deal with fundamental properties of string theories. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy and the World Academy of Sciences. He is a recipient of Shantiswarup Bhatnagar Prize for the Physical Sciences and the J.C. Bose Fellowship 2008. He has been an editor of Journal of High Energy Physics since its inception. He was an invited speaker at the International Conferences Strings 2002-2002-2008 and was one of the organizers in String 2001. He is chair of the panel of on scientific values of the Indian Academy of Sciences. In addition to physics, Professor Mukhi has several interests mainly in Indian classical music. He has been the lead vocalist of heavy metal band Let's Keep Thinking at Iser Pune. His other interests include travel, meditation, software, literature, jazz and rock music and cooking. Before we start, I urge all of you to use Teams Q&A future to ask. We'll stop in between for any questions. Without further ado, I request Professor Mukhi to take over. Thank you, Rishik. I hope other people, I hope you and everyone can hear me. Uh, yes. I feel I, I'm about to start, but I just would like to know roughly like how many people are on this uh, thing. I mean, just uh, it's it's very strange not to see the audience. So just if you tell me something about the audience would be nice. There are around 30 people right now. Okay, very good. Okay, so thank you uh, everyone for coming for this talk and um, uh, I hope you find it interesting. Uh, so I have uh, actually um, planned this talk uh, to be essentially historical, but history is not just um, a set of events. I have picked and chosen those events and those things that I think teach us some uh, lesson, the lesson which I want to convey. And without further ado, I'll start. So, uh, oops, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, just one quick disclaimer that I'm using images and quotes which uh, uh, are used under doctrine of fair use. Uh, so in case there are copyright issues. Very good. I'll start with a few quote, quotes from very famous people. Hopefully you'll recognize the people, but if not anyway, I can tell you. So Galileo said the laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics. I'll, much later, uh, when Schrodinger said it is a miracle that in spite of the baffling complexity of the world, certain regularities can be discovered. <clears throat> this person, I think you don't need to know who he is. The only physical theories we are willing to accept are beautiful ones. And this is Wigner. Mathematics plays a more sovereign role in physics. And I'm going to try in this talk to communicate this notion of the sovereign role of mathematics. So with these four quotes, uh, all of which uh, teach us that there's something special about the laws of physics, uh, let me try to make uh, a little story. And that story will uh, start with the observation that we've seen sensational experimental discoveries in the last 120 years ago, roughly from the start of the 20th century until now. And uh, some of these are as follows. Uh, two new fields were created by experiments, subatomic sub physics and then later subnuclear or particle physics as it's now known. Uh, this happened because we could split the atom essentially and look inside it. On the other side, in the very large scale, astronomers learned 
that black holes are the most common objects in the universe. And I'll have a bit to say about that later in this talk. Now, there's yet another side that's different from subatomic or subnuclear physics and from black hole physics or astronomy, and that is the physics of materials. And this already changed sometime in the middle of the last century with the discovery of materials which our ancestors could have never imagined, semiconductors and superconductors, uh, and many others, of course. Uh, more recently, the focus is on new materials called topological materials, and I'll have something to say about these also. Now, during the same period as these experiments were going on, theorists were working very hard to formulate theories to describe these experiments. And as you know very well, quantum mechanics, special relativity, general relativity, and also many body or quantum field theory, these are equivalent ways of describing it. All these were developed in the 20th century. Now, mostly, uh, and at least in the case of quantum mechanics, special relativity and quantum field theory, they were invented to explain specific experimental discoveries and they did so very well. But conversely, the underlying structure of these theories gave strong constraints on what is possible in nature. And here I want you to appreciate the surprise how can mathematical structure of a theory give us constraints on what is possible? It looks like nature is free to do what she wants and it's our job to explain it. But strangely, the mathematical structure of all our theories gave us constraints on what nature can do. It's very hard to understand why that is so, but history shows us that it is so. A famous article based on a lecture delivered by uh, Eugene Wigner at um, New York University in 1959 is titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And uh, I'll have some things to say about this, uh, this talk and this lecture, which is available on the net. I encourage you to read it. Uh, in this, he basically made the point that mathematics is more effective than we might think when describing the natural sciences. I showed you some quotes a minute ago. Uh, Galileo said that you know, now physics is expressed in the language or nature works in the language of mathematics. But Wigner said, no, it goes beyond that. Mathematics is sovereign in its description of natural science. And this is the theme of my talk today. Now, physics has moved far beyond what Wigner could have imagined. Um, and what I'll do in this talk is to talk about some uh, phenomena uh, over uh, that were discovered both in Wigner's time and that were discovered after Wigner's time. So in a sense, it will be my humble attempt to update some of his ideas. And what I'll describe is how mathematical considerations have predicted real world phenomena, experimental phenomena over a wide range of sub areas. And these are the areas I want to touch on in the present talk. Antiparticles, topological materials, hadrons and quarks, weak bosons, and finally black holes. As you see, this covers the very small, the subject of particle physics. It covers the very large, the subject of black holes, and it also covers complicated materials, uh, which are the subject of condensed matter physics. And I'll try to weave a story around all of these. There are many other examples uh, which I had to leave out regretfully. And if this talk starts to run over time, I may leave out the weak boson section. Uh, but the other four I definitely would like to cover. After going through these examples, I will show, share some of my own thoughts and concerns uh, about the role of mathematics in contemporary physics. OK, so we'll start with antiparticles. Uh, I'm assuming that much of my audience has read a little bit of history, just the level of magazines, Wikipedia and so on. Uh, and also maybe you've had some basic physics courses. And you know that there's an equation called the Schrodinger equation that describes the wave function of particles in quantum mechanics. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this I think I took even from Schrodinger's original paper. Sometimes we write it with the h bar squared on the other side, but this is uh, an equivalent way. Now the problem with this equation, even though it's 
correct in some domain is that it's not compatible with the special theory of relativity. In fact, mathematically, the special theory of relativity is invariant under a group called the Lorentz group, and this consists of rotations as well as Lorentz boosts. Uh, which according to Einstein are symmetries of nature. And this equation isn't invariant under Lorentz boosts. Therefore, it can't be the right equation uh, to describe nature if relativity is correct. And in 1928, Paul Dirac realized this problem and published a new wave equation which carries his name, which is compar uh, compatible with this SO3, comma 1 symmetry. So this is the paper, 1928. The heading of the paper is Quantum Theory of the Electron, uh, and uh, it's by Dirac, as I said. Uh, just as a little sidelight, here's a picture of Dirac in India uh, with Purnima Sinha, who is one of the earliest uh, women physicists uh, in India. And there's a whole story about her and her career, which you can read about uh, on the internet. Um, now here's Dirac's equation. It looks like this. Uh, it has some um, some kind of matrices. These sigma are matrices, and uh, they act uh, the Pauli matrices actually, and they act on a multi-component wave function. You may or may not have seen this equation. Anyone who's going to be a physicist sooner or later will see the equation. Now, what were the predictions of Dirac's equation, which he got from a mathematical consideration? Well, it had two kinds of states, positive energy states, which he identified with electrons, and negative energy states, which remained a bit of a puzzle for some time until he published a second paper trying to explain what they might be. The puzzle was that without special relativity, Schrodinger's equation does not give us negative energy states, but Dirac's equation does. And this turns out to be an inevitable consequence of this SO3, 1 symmetry or Lorentz symmetry. So here's a schematic representation where there are energy levels. I hope you can see my cursor. And these are the first, second, third level. Each one can accommodate two uh, particles by the Pauli exclusion principle, particles which spin up and down. And then here are the negative energy states. So what are the negative energy states? Well, Dirac proposed that to start with in the vacuum, uh, nature has somehow filled all the negative energy states with electrons. So the picture is like this. The X's represent empty states, unoccupied, and the circles represent occupied states, and they're all filled all the way down to the bottom, to minus infinity. This was his proposal. And in this proposal, an electron in this negative energy C, as it was called, can transition to a positive energy state. So here, the electron, which used to be in this position, has moved up to this position, leaving behind a hole. The hole, because it's the absence of an electron, behaves like a positively charged particle. And because it's the absence of an electron of negative energy, it behaves like a particle of posit positive energy and it was called the positron. But the only problem was nobody had ever seen a positron. So here Dirac had this equation, which he did uh, obtain through nice mathematics, but it predicted a particle that no one had seen. It also predicted that electrons and positrons must be created in pairs because it's when the electron moves from here to here that the empty space over here behaves like a different particle called the positron. And so you must, here you've created a new electron up here and you've also created a new positron down here. So they're created in pairs. Well, it sounds like a man mathematical fantasy, but it's real. In just a couple of years, so Dirac's equation was to 1928, then he wrote another paper, I think, a couple of years later. And in cosmic rays, uh, Carl Anderson in this experiment detected positrons in 1932, and they were unambiguously the ones predicted by Dirac's equation. This led to studies of whether other particles have corresponding antiparticles, just as the positron is an anti-electron. And today we know many other forms of antimatter. So muons, which are other particles similar to electrons, but heavier, they have antimuons. Quarks have antiquarks. Neutrinos have antineutrinos. So this antiparticle seems to be a thing used by nature, and it doubles the number of particles that we thought we had. 
The only thing is they're not stable and therefore we have to do an experiment to see them. OK, so uh, this is one thing that uh, one example where mathematics played an important role in discovering real physical phenomena. So I can pause now for questions on this section and I'll pause after each section. Are there any questions about this story? Yeah, there is one question asking, could you expand upon SO3 one? SO3 comma 1 symmetry is it group? Yeah, uh, it's a group. It's a, it's the orthogonal group. SO3 comma 1 is the orthogonal group, but it's a slight generalization. So if if I had written SO4, it would be the group that uh, has uh, of 4 by 4 matrices O, which satisfy O transpose times O is 1. But SO3 comma 1 uh, is a group of matrices which satisfies a slightly different condition corresponding to the fact that the metric of space time uh, in relativity has a negative sign for time. If you don't know this, you'll certainly learn it when you learn relativity. And because the time direction has a negative sign relative to space directions, the one is singled out from the three. So SO3 one is a group of symmetries uh, in a space time uh, which has three space and one time direction. That's why three comma one. OK, if there are no more questions, I'll move on. Thank you for that. Uh, now the second um, topic is completely appears completely disconnected, but there's a surprise and honestly, I'm no expert on topological materials, but I found the history very surprising and interesting. Uh, by the way, this is not a complete history of topological materials, but just one aspect of them. Now, after ant antiparticles were discovered, people thought, OK, muons have antiparticles, quarks have antiparticles, neutrinos have antiparticles. Probably all fermions in nature have antiparticles. But an Italian physicist at a very young age, Ettore Majorana, as he was known, proposed that maybe there are some fermions which are their own antiparticles. Such fermions would have to be electrically neutral because antiparticles always carry the opposite charge of a particle. For example, electron we know has a negative charge, positron has a positive charge. That follows from the picture I drew. But Majorana said, well, why can't there be fermions which are uncharged and which are equal to their antiparticle? So there's no doubling of this sort. And there's a he's, he's quite an interesting figure because soon after this, um, paper and uh, after his initial research work, he disappeared and was never seen again and people have no idea what happened. So there's a whole story. You can Google it. But the important point is that his idea uh, has lived on as a theoretical idea that there's something called a Majorana fermion, which is very different from the electron or muon, which is it, in fact its own antiparticle. And people think that maybe some types of neutrinos could be Majorana fermions. It's an open question. However, to date, no Majorana fermion has been seen. So as far as we know, Majorana, Majorana's idea, although nice and coming from good mathematics, hasn't worked. Now, I'll turn to a different person and a different era. In 1978, a legendary physicist, Edward Witten, um, who's done many, uh, you know, extra, written many extremely important papers, mostly in string theory and in uh, quantum field theory. He studied uh, hypothetical particles called magnetic monopoles and wrote a short but very um, incisive or very, very um, beautiful paper pointing out the following. He pointed out that if we do have magnetic monopoles, but nature doesn't have this symmetry called CP. CP is charge conjugation together with parity. C is for charge conjugation, P is for parity. And he pointed out that if CP symmetry is violated, then monopoles don't remain monopoles. They acquire electric charges as well. So they have both magnetic and electric charges. And he gave a formula for what electric charges are allowed and they are fractional. And so they become dions, which are particles with both magnetic and electric charges. This is a very beautiful idea and a very beautiful concept, and it looks like it should be true, but to date, no such elementary particle has ever been seen, neither a magnetic monopole nor a dion. So 
we'll come back to this this, this uh, work in a minute. In 1987, Frank Wilczek noticed that if certain hypothetical particles called axions exist, then the laws of electromagnetism get modified with very interesting consequences. And one of the things that he noted was that Witten's effect, this dionic fractional dionic effect called the Witten effect could be explained in the language of axions. Okay. Now, axions are thought to play a role in cosmology uh, and they're thought to play fundamental roles uh, related to CP symmetry, CP violation, and so to the symmetry structure of nature itself. However, to date, no elementary particle called the axion has been seen. So I've just covered three proposals, Majorana fermion, Witten's dions, and axions. None of them have been seen. Maybe none of them exist. So were these theoretical ideas wasted? Are these papers that Witten and Wilczek feel, well, it's a pity I, I spent some time on the idea, but it didn't work out. OK, of course, these people need not have any regrets. Witten has a Fields Medal in mathematics. Wilczek has a Nobel Prize for other work. But this particular, these particular ideas seem to be wasted. And the beautiful thing is they're not. Enter topological materials. One of the hottest topics in condensed matter physics in recent years is topological materials. And they're exciting because they're materials that possess properties that conventional materials can't possess, don't possess. So you have to engineer the material in a certain way. You have to look in certain places in certain, uh, you know, you have to construct certain things which have these topological properties. And I'll talk about these very briefly. The key property of topological materials is that their boundary, their surface is different from their bulk. And uh, tip, uh, one example is in topological insulators. The bulk is an insulator, but the boundary is conducting. So currents can flow on the surface of the topological insulator, but not in the bulk. And as you can see from this figure here, certain types of currents are allowed to flow only in certain directions. So it's a very directional thing and it's a very surface related thing. And I emphasize, you know, it's not like taking an insulator and pasting some aluminum foil on it and then the foil stuck on the surface will conduct. That's not how it works. If I chop a topological insulator in half, the new boundary will conduct. It's a boundary effect. And this one shows, this figure shows it nicely that if I look, if I peek inside a topological uh, insulator, only the surface, this yellow lit up thing is conducting, but the inside is insulating. There are also things called second order and third order insulators where only these lines conduct or only these points conduct. It's all very strange. Uh, and the point I want to make is that, you know, a few decades ago, nobody had heard of these things. They're very new. Now, the interesting thing is that Witten's dions and Wilczek's uh, modification of laws of electromagnetism called axions are seen in these materials. So they're not seen in nature. They're not found in particle physics experiments so far, but they're seen in these experiments. And a beautiful and very influential paper was written, written by these authors, Chi, Hughes, and Zhang in 2008. And you can see that uh, it's been the subject of a physics viewpoint as well as an article in Physical Review's 50th anniversary milestones. So it's considered a seminal article in the field. Now, what these authors showed was that a certain observable called magnetoelectric polarization in TRI topological insulators, TRI is time reversal invariant, as in this title, plays the role of an axion. So the observable, which is like a local field in this insulator, uh, behaves like an axion in, uh, in nature, the axion particle that was proposed and studied later by Wilczek. So it obeys similar equations to the equations for an axion. Not only that, uh, if this uh, axion quantity, this polarization has a gradient in time, that means it changes in time, that induces something called the temporal magnetoelectric effect. And in presence of this effect, magnetic excitations in this material satisfy the Witten formula for dions. They become dions, they're no longer magnetic monopoles, they acquire a fractional electric charge. So two beautiful papers from the 70s and 80s 
which didn't seem to have worked in particle physics, seem to have worked instead in these topological insulators. And I urge you to read more about this topic. What about poor Majorana and his Majorana fermions? Well, they arise in topological superconductors. Actually, the search for Majorana fermions in topological materials has been going on for a decade and there have been many little discoveries which people felt were almost the discovery and so on. But this one published in Science in 2018 seems to be considered a robust and very important uh, discovery in the field. This was done in China and the paper is called Evidence for Majorana Bound States in an iron based superconductor and it's a topological superconductor and here are some plots from their uh, paper. Um, I won't go into details partly because of time and partly because I actually am not that familiar with the details of these experiments, but the point that they make is that there is concrete evidence for uh, particles which are fermionic. These are some kind of quasi particle like excitations in the material. Uh, or on its boundary actually on its surface which uh, are their own antiparticles. So the, the particle and its antiparticle are equivalent. It would be like an electron and a hole being the same thing which sounds absurd and well this is the whole point that in this system this absurd possibility that Majorana dreamed of in the 1930s is realized. And so this led to this uh, this note in 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 this in uh, in physics, uh, which is titled "High Energy Physics in the New Guys," and uh, it's based on the the previous papers that I showed you, especially the Axion one, the TRI insulator, and it says the same physics, though in a much different context, applies to an unusual class of insulators. And so the author says. These developments have propelled axion electrodynamics, which is what Wilczek wrote about, from an idle curiosity to an experimentally observable reality. I must admit, I don't like the word idle curiosity. I think he was using it somewhat jokingly. It was a mathematical theoretical curiosity, but it turned into an experimentally observable reality. And Wilczek has a lot to be happy about uh, that the idea that he had while not realized in particle physics, turns out to work in condensed matter instead in these new materials. Okay, any questions on this? Yes, what does it mean for a point to conduct? Yeah, I don't know myself what it means for a point to conduct, but I think uh, yeah, I agree were, that was in this picture here. OK, so certainly I know what this line conducting means. You can put up something here and something here and a current will flow. Uh, I assume that these things you see, these are these are not uh, exactly dots, right? They're not infinitesimal dots because they are real. These are real materials. So I assume that you could make a rounded corner and then if you put some probe just in the corner, then you'll find conduction, but none over here and none over here. Uh, I chose this figure because it's pretty. Uh, I really like the blue and yellow colors, uh, but uh, these are the usual topological insulators that everyone talks about and these are called second order or higher order topological insulators about which uh, I think somewhat less is known. There are two questions about uh, antimatter. Yes. And, uh, will bosons or any particles which doesn't satisfy poly exclusion principle Will, will they have antiparticle counterparts? Very good question. So the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, the example where it's yes is W bosons, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, w bosons are charged and they have antiparticles which have the opposite charge. So W plus and W minus, they are bosons and they have equal and opposite charge. But the Z particle or Z particle, which also appears together with these, uh, that's a neutral particle and it is its own antiparticle. The photon is another boson that's also its own antiparticle and the Higgs boson also as far as we know is its own antiparticle. So for bosons, it's not that surprising. For fermions, it's considered more of a surprise. There's one more question asking if uh, Dirac's conception of positrons, is, is it theoretically valid today? Oh, absolutely. Positrons absolutely exist. Positron, you can even have positron beams. You can have positron colliders. Uh, you have positron uh, emission to tomography. You have, uh, positrons are used all the time. They're even used in medicine. 
So, you know, positrons are, uh, the only point is they don't just sit around. They, you won't have positrons lying on your desk or in your home because the moment they see an electron, they annihilate. Hmm? But uh, you can create them uh, in any kind of synchrotron or accelerator. You can create positrons and electrons in pairs. And because they have opposite charge, you can filter out the positrons and use them for something. So positrons are very, very much real quantity, real objects. They exist in nature. Homi Bhabha built his career on a very seminal, by writing a very seminal paper on positrons, by the way. So yeah, absolutely real, even today. That's all fun. Okay, good. Then let me go on to hadrons and quarks. So here's a different story. Uh, during the 1950s, uh, a lot of new particles called hadrons were discovered in experiments and these were all strongly interacting, that is via the strong nuclear force. And it was not clear at the time if they were elementary or, com or composite. That became clear somewhat later, turns out they are composite. But you know, in those days, the resolution available wasn't enough for people to tell that. So they treated them as just some new particles. So, okay, we have protons, neutrons, electrons. Now we have uh, new kinds of hadrons, which are generalized versions of protons and neutrons with different spins, different masses, different charges. And there were lots of them, lots and lots and lots. And it made people crazy. Why did nature provide so many new particles? It also made people happy because there were lots of papers they could write, but it was a huge puzzle. And in 1961, Gelman and independently Yuval Neyman proposed a classification scheme for these hadrons based on another kind of group, SU3. Earlier I talked about SO31, here I'm talking about SU3, the special unitary group of three by three matrices. So he, knew some a little bit of mathematics of this SU3, which most physicists didn't know. And he realized that although there are so many particles, they form groups or multiples, multiplets or representations of SU3. It was actually a guess. You might almost say a wild guess. But what he noticed was that they seem to follow the mathematical rules of SU3 representations. And he wrote this in a kind of preliminary paper in 1961. Uh, preprint, uh, in fact, at Caltech, I think. He called it the eightfold way because he was also of, uh, a reader of philosophy and uh, the Buddha, Buddhist philosophy has something called eightfold way. But the trick here is that SU3, in a certain sense, one of the important representations is eight dimensional. And we'll see that in on the next page. Okay. So SU3 is a mathematical object called a Lie algebra and Lie algebras have representations which are vector spaces where the symmetries act. And Gelman said, look, elementary particles fall into representations. And he drew this picture. So here's the familiar neutron and proton. Here are some new uh, hadrons, sigma minus, sigma zero, sigma plus, psi minus, psi zero and lambda. So that all together, that is six over here and two over here. Why did he draw it like this? Because he found that their properties fit with what is called the root space or the root diagram of SU3. And this is exactly the root diagram of SU3. Now, I don't have the time to explain it in detail or what is strangeness and so on, but uh, SU3 has six roots and two, uh, and it has rank two. And adding the six roots and the rank two, you get eight. So there are eight particles in this diagram. And this diagram can be found in a mathematics textbook which discusses SU3, any mathematics textbook that discusses the group SU3 or the algebra SU3. And he said, well, in a certain sense, these particles correspond nicely to the representation. Namely, I can identify which particle should be where and I can tell you the a formula for their charges and so on, which is compatible with their placement on this diagram, which labels their electric charge and another quantity called their strangeness. And uh, because they all lie in the same representation of SU3, they should all have roughly comparable masses. And it turns out that within about 30 or 40 percent, their masses are all equal. This may not seem great, but it's pretty close. OK, so he did this and uh, he knew about representations of SU3 and he noted that the simplest ones are like this. They have dimensions 3, 8 and 10. And he then tried to classify all the new particles uh, to see if they fit 
into some representation and he found that most of them fitted nicely either into an 8 or a 10. So uh, out of let's say five dozen particles known, he could fit eight of them into an eight, another 10 into a 10 representation and so on, but there were some gaps. So the eight dimensional representation for mesons contained three pions and four K mesons, but there wasn't an eighth meson that could fit in the diagram for mesons. So he said, well, if it's not known, that's because they haven't found it, it should be there. And knowing basic particle physics and basic, of course, he knew particle physics very well and basic group theory, he could tell the experimenters how it should decay uh, under certain conditions. So he gave a prediction. And later that year, this particle was discovered and it's called the eta meson and it had exactly the properties that Gelman predicted. So that was remarkable just from group theory and saying, well, there should be eight particles of this type, but there are only seven. One more must exist. He predicted a new one. But unfortunately, this preprint, what I showed you, is the only form of this work. So his prediction was not well acknowledged and the particle was found very soon, soon after it. So in 1962, he said, well, I'll do it again. This time he took a set of baryons. Uh, which are heavier typically, and he grouped them into a 10 dimensional representation of SU3 called a decuplet and found one missing. And this time he was he was bold and he was lucky. It wasn't known. And he said, well, uh, we I predict the omega baryon and these are the properties. If you should find it, this is the mass it should have roughly. This is the electric charge it should have. And this is the strangeness, which is a particular quantum number that it should have. And that will govern how it is produced and how it decays. And this prediction was crystal clear. And this was in 1962 and two years later it was found. So worked beautifully. So here's a diagram. This is the meson octet and the eta was not known before uh, 1961 and Gelman predicted it and it was found soon thereafter. Here's the omega minus. You see that it lies in this beautiful triangle with four, three, two and one particle of which the four were known, the deltas, the sigma stars were known, the psi stars were known and only omega was missing and he knew what it should be like and he was right. Following this success, he made yet another proposal. He thought, well, all of these particles are fitting in the 8 and the 10. What about the 3, which is the smallest representation of SU3? Something should fit in that. And he proposed that there will be there are fundamental particles which fit in this 3 and all hadrons, all of the ones we've seen earlier, are bound states of those. And he thereby proposed constituents of hadrons called quarks. And he realized that in mathematics, we tensor three dimensional representations to get an eight or a 10. And uh, the analog in physics should be that we bind them to get higher representations. That was a beautiful idea. So he proposed three new particles, up, down and strange quarks. He realized that to form the bound states we know, they must have fractional electric charges like this. Um, he proposed that baryons are bound states of three quarks for example, proton uh, and mesons are bound states of, an of a quark and an antiquark. So these are the kind of diagrams we draw. And today there are more quarks, but at his, in his time, only three were known. OK, this gave rise to new predictions. And in particular, uh, I, uh, if we assume that there are three quarks and three antiquarks, then there should be nine bound states. Just combine U, D and S with U bar, D bar, S bar, which are the antiquarks in all possible ways and you get nine. Now the meson octet we saw earlier only had eight particles. And in fact, SU3 group theory says that eight particles, uh, if seven of them exist, the eighth must exist. But there can be another particle that's a singlet and SU3 group theory doesn't say that the singlet also has to occur in nature. But the quark hypothesis says it should. And therefore we should have one more meson beyond the octet and indeed, uh, a new meson called the eta prime was discovered in 1964, and it's exactly the ninth meson uh, made up or uh, making up this complete basis. Also, it's uh, rather split in mass from the octet, 
which is allowed because SU3 group theory only says that within the octet, the masses should be comparable. So it's a whole story. You'll learn about it if you find this interesting. I'm just trying to give a glimpse, but I should tell you that both theorists and experimentalists uh, were very, very uh, questioning of this theory and very skeptical. Uh, they said, well, you say there are quarks with fractional charges. Well, where are they? We've never seen them. Fractional charges would be easy to observe because all the charges we measure in nature are integer, integer multiples of the electron charge. So where are these things? And well, in 1968, experiments were done where essentially an electron was smashed against a proton and uh, what the electron did was to emit a virtual photon which would go deep inside this particle and probe its interior structure according to the rules of quantum theory. And it was found that inside these objects, there are indeed very small point-like structures, much smaller than this object. And uh, there, are three, there are exactly three inside a proton uh, or a neutron. But even when this happened, physicists were reluctant to agree that these are Gelman quarks. Feynman even invented a new name, partons. And for Feynman, partons were the thing that experimentalists were seeing and quarks were something else which theorists had predicted. And for many years, papers talked only about partons until it became clear that, well, Gelman was exactly right, Gelman and Zweig, the quarks they predicted are the partons. They are real, except that they are permanently confined inside hadrons and that's why we don't see them propagating freely. So this is what I have to say about uh, hadrons. And again, I'm happy to pause for questions. What interaction or physical quantity does the strangeness quantum number correspond to? So actually the strangeness quantum number is not uh, considered very fundamental in the modern age. Uh, at the time it was just, you know, there are six, it turns out that six different kinds of quarks in nature and we just give them names, up, down, strange, charm, top, bottom. Now the point is, that strange, a strange quark is somewhat heavier than the up and down quarks. And so any particle which contains a strange quark uh, will be heavier. And also uh, it has a limitation that it's uh, less likely, though it does, it can decay in a way that loses strangeness, it's less likely to do so. So decays where the strangeness is lost, that means decays where the strange quark disappears and is replaced by a lighter one are called strangeness changing decays. So it was just a label for a certain class of objects uh, which because of their strangeness were not decaying at the rate that otherwise we would have thought they should decay. So once they have that tag of strangeness, they become a little more stable than we expected. Uh, it turns out that these are these are flavors. It's in some deep sense, it's still a mystery, but strangeness is not a conserved quantity. It's only approximately conserved, but uh, it was very useful just at the time to just to classify uh, the different quarks. What is the theoretical origin of mass, strangeness and other properties? Is it related to the symmetry group? I mean, why don't we describe the electron by its strangeness? Yeah, so electrons don't have strangeness. So actually, this is what is called the flavor problem. So the flavor problem in modern language is that these six quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom, arise in three, three pairs called doublets. So up and down is one, charm and strange is one, top and bottom is one. Okay, and they are all copies of each other except they get heavier and heavier. So charm and strange are heavier than up and down and top and bottom are heavier than charm and strange. They are called generations of families. The family problem is the fact that these uh, strongly interacting particles, quarks, they just keep recurring in three copies which have nothing different about them except their masses essentially. On the electron side, uh, we also see these three doublets. The electron and its neutrino are one doublet. Muon and muon neutrino are another doublet. And tau lepton and tau lepton tau neutrino are a third doublet. There are also three families of leptons or the uh, like electrons. So yeah, you could say that in a way muons are like the strange version of electrons. Uh, 
Hmm? But uh, the puzzle is that in, in modern language, we don't say that there are six flavors. We say there are three doublets because we understand the doublet nature. We don't so much understand why there are three copies of these doublets. That's an open puzzle. It's a very important problem in particle physics. It's called the flavor problem. So you can Google flavor problem and you'll hear about strangeness, charm and all these things. Can you clarify the meaning of point like structures? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, anything which is small is point like on the scale of the experiment which I'm doing. If I see it as small, it's point like. So, you know, if I'm if I'm just a clumsy person in my house, then one uh, seed of jira or something in my kitchen is point like for me. But obviously, if I put that jira under a microscope, it's made of thousands of molecules. Uh, which contain all the, you know, which give off all the flavors that are we associate with Jira uh, when we cook. And so of, obviously those molecules are more fundamental and more point like than the than the seed. But if I go in the molecule, I'll find they're made of atoms, which are even more point like than the molecule. So point likeness is a relative thing. It's not an absolute thing. However, it, at any given time in history, we refer to those particles as point like which are which we don't have any evidence that they have substructure. For example, today quarks and electrons, muons and so on. Uh, we have absolutely no evidence that they have any substructure. So we consider them point like if that changes, so be it. No problem. So the quarks which are sitting inside the uh, proton were point like in the sense they were much, much smaller than the protons and neutrons. So protons and neutrons have a certain typical size which is uh, related to what's called form factor. And these point like structures were not like one third. So, you know, if, if I imagine three quarks in a proton, it's not like each quark occupied one third of the interior volume. It was like the interior volume is mostly empty and there are three very, very small quarks in there. Hmm? Bit like a bag with three, uh, you know, little sweets rattling around in it. A big a box of candy with three sweets rattling around. That's a model of this uh, system. So point like is just relative. But it's very important. You may know that in atomic structure, the nucleus is point like in the atom. So you know that there used to be a cake. I don't forget what it was called plum cake model where the atom was a fuzzy thing like a sponge and then the electrons were put in like 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 kishmish on the top of it. <coughs> but that was wrong. And the diffraction experiments showed that instead the nucleus is very small compared to the atom. So similarly, quarks are very small compared to the uh, proton. OK. Is that good? Shall I go on? Yes. OK. What I'd like to do now actually is to skip the, the weak bosons part because I actually think it's not essential for the point I'm trying to make. Uh, but I will show you one uh, slide uh, from there which is that uh, from uh, prediction using a mathematical theory to detection can take a long time. Now Dirac was lucky. He predicted the positron in this window 28 to 31 in two papers. It was found in 32. So it was in a scale of one to three years. Oh, sorry. My sharing seems to have been paused. Uh, can you see it or not see it? Yeah, we can see, but it's the old slide. Oh, OK, because I uh, because I un, uh, un full screened it and I full screened it again, but it should uh, it's OK. I think I better unshare and reshare. Let me try that. Uh, good. OK, uh, now I'm trying to full screen it. Ah, there it goes. Is it good now? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. OK, good. Sorry about that. So good. So the positron took one to three years uh, to discover. Uh, neutrinos, which I didn't discuss in today's talk, uh, were predicted in 31 and discovered in 56 or 25 years. The eta meson, I told you, Gelman was a little unlucky that it was found the same year he predicted it, but the omega baryon had the decency to wait two years. Quarks from deep inelastic scattering were seen in 68. It took four years, and even then, nobody really was sure that this 68 discovery was quarks. It took another five, six years 
for people to con be convinced, like and so on and so forth. The Higgs boson, which I'm not talking about here, was predicted in this range, 64 to 1967, and it took 45 to 48 years to be found. So this mathematical physics relation to reality can take a very long time. Because of this, there are some sociological issues in people not understanding the value of mathematical physics. By the way, I use mathematical in a very general sense, like theoretical physics using deep theoretical formulas. Hmm? Uh, people don't understand its value and I will speak about it a little bit and I will say something about those people at the end of my talk. OK, now let me go to black holes, which is surely everyone's favorite topic. Uh, it all started in 1916, one year after Einstein's paper on rel uh, general relativity with this paper by uh, uh, by Carl Schwarzschild, uh, which uh, actually found a solution of Einstein's general theory of relativity. So a solution uh, in, his, in Einstein's theory means a space time, the metric of space time, the structure of a particular space time. Each space time is a different solution of Einstein's equations. And this one didn't require there to be any matter supporting it. OK, and but it was a very strange solution because deep in its center, there was a place where space and time appear to become singular. And that's a very puzzling thing. Now, this was studied by not many people. You can see this huge gap during which, you know, uh, all kinds of wars broke out and the world was pretty convulsed uh, with a lot of uh, things. But Oppenheimer and Snyder in 1939 argued that if I take spherically symmetric matter, anything like a star, but really symmetric, then they showed by equations that it will collapse to such an object as what Schwarzschild found. And they'll collapse in such a way that they form a horizon, which is like a one way membrane. And in their minds, what happens is that there's nothing inside. OK, there's a, formally there's a singularity, but they believe that if we are outside, we're never going to be able to go inside. So there's a kind of place where space and time come to an end. So it's like an end point of collapse, but it does require spherical symmetry. OK, now later on, uh, actually in the 50s and 60s, uh, this was interpreted as a space time where one can go in, but nothing can come out and therefore it was named a black hole. OK, and it became clear at that point that by equations you can show that if I throw something into this star, it will go in. There's no problem it going, with it going through the horizon, just that in classical general relativity, you'll never see it coming back out, never even in principle. Now in the physics community, this black hole object was treated as a mathematical curiosity. People like Schwarzschild or of course Einstein and of course later Oppenheimer uh, and people who worked in the 60s uh, like Wheeler. They were brilliant people who knew some mathematics, but the rest of physics community was like, no, this we don't believe. It's just some you have some equations and you're doing some trickery with the equations and finding some curiosity. Where's the experiment? Where's the reality? What does it have to do with reality? Nothing. So that was that. By the way, this picture isn't a picture of reality. This is a this is a kind of artist's impression of of the black hole, which shows black because nothing, no light is coming out from there. Now, Fred Hoyle, among others, took an astronomy problem, which is that quasars were being discovered, quasi-stellar objects which had very specific properties and which needed an explanation. And he said, maybe these are those black holes. So he was trying to link. Uh, things that were real, namely quasars, and things that were proposed in mathematics, namely black holes. And it was in this background uh, that uh, something new happened. The problem is, right up until this time, the only thing we knew was that um, very spherically symmetric stars uh, can collapse into black holes, but they need exact spherical symmetry. But that's not how nature works. Something which is symmetric, something may smash into it, it may move around, it may be distorted a little bit by the gravitational field of something else. After all, even the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It has its lumps and bumps. And who knows whether a lumpy, bumpy object is going to form a black hole. It doesn't follow from Oppenheimer Snyder's paper. And this all changed. Uh, because a young British mathematician, Roger Penrose, entered the scene in 1964 and started to study this problem. I think this was like only his second physics paper. 
He was, by the way, 23 years old in 1964. Sorry, did I do a meha? 33 years old. He was 33. He was born in 1931. So sorry, he was 33 years old. Uh, yeah, uh, not that young. But uh, previously he had worked mostly in mathematics. He was really a mathematician working in a mathematics department. So his first papers, in fact, were on pure mathematics and his very first paper is called a generalized inverse for matrices. So this is a paper about algebra and it defines some operations between matrices uh, where you can you know, try to formulate the concept of inverse for matrices which are not normally invertible. And this paper he actually did write at the age of 23. This is 1954. Okay. What else did he do in the 50s? Well, he did various things, but one of the cute things he did, and I'm not sure if people know this, is to develop the Penrose Triangle, which is this triangle shown here, we, uh, together with his father, who was also a person very interested in mathematics. You see, the I, I think you must have seen this triangle. It's an optical illusion. Any of its corners looks like a reasonable 3D figure with two blocks joined together nicely, but it just doesn't fit sensibly. So the perspective of the three different corners just fails to match. OK, so it's an impossible triangle can't be realized in real life. Uh, I should tell you that uh, the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge has uh, this uh, this impossible figure. They made something which looks like it and planted it outside as a sculpture. He also made, they also designed this impossible staircase where you see from starting from here, you can climb, 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 then climb, 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 then climb, 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 climb more. And you're back at your starting point having climbed four times. So this is obviously impossible also because you should have gained height. So this crazy stuff is one of the, uh, among the things that he was doing. Now, I shouldn't say that this was all he was doing, but these are very brilliant ideas, uh, except that they are uh, definitely not physics. Now, as a little aside, uh, there was a mutual inspiration between Penrose and the Dutch artist Escher, who made this famous painting that some of you might have seen. And it's the same uh, idea as the Penrose staircase. Uh, the stairs are going up, 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 and people are marching up, 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 coming back to where they were. Other people are marching down, 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 down and coming back to where they were. <coughs> and Escher specialized in these lovely impossible figures. Uh, and actually Escher says he was influenced by Penrose. Penrose says he was influenced by Escher. So that's a very interesting sidelight. But again, none of this uh, has anything direct to do with physics. These are beautiful mathematical illusions, if you like. Uh, and that's what they are. OK, but, but in 1965, Penrose published a paper uh, studying the time development of collapsing objects as predicted by Einstein's equations, essentially the same problem that had been studied by Oppenheimer and Snyder nearly three decades before him. But what he did was that he did not assume spherical symmetry. He said, I'm just going to not going to assume spherical symmetry through the whole collapse. Maybe in the beginning there's some symmetry, but let's follow the object as it collapses and see what happens. And he found that for a reasonably symmetric object, as it starts to collapse, something called a closed trapped surface can form. Now, this is a surface in space time. It's very difficult to visualize, but this picture from Penrose's paper is extremely famous. It's not a rocket ship as it looks like, but rather this is a cross section of space time. So this is an object like a star and it's shrinking. So it's collapsing and at some point, what it's done is to become trapped mathematically. And these are little light cones which show the way that light rays can propagate. And in this space time, once the surface becomes trapped, then nothing you do can uh, prevent it from collapsing. So there's an inevitability to collapse. Once collapse starts and gets going, there's a time after which nothing you can do, even in principle, will stop it collapsing. So once a closed trapped surface forms, even though it forms, it can form at low densities and without any sensational things happening, collapse becomes inevitable. And that was really the result. And this is, by the way, a three page paper, which is quite dense with mathematics. And I would say that, you know, more than 90 percent of physicists today would be unable to follow it because it uses quite difficult mathematics of Riemannian space times, that is, uh, or pseudo Riemannian space times, space times which are space and time, not just a space. 
Differential geometry was already well studied for spaces, but the differential geometry of space time has much more richness uh, because it's associated with causal behavior of light signals and so on. And that's what Penrose was a master at. And his conclusion was very simple. He said deviations from spherical symmetry cannot prevent space time singularities from arising uh, after a certain time in the collapse. So there's a point of no return. This means that not just very, very special stars which are completely spherical, but all kinds of stars could collapse into black holes. So now it becomes a much more likely and much more generic process. But the worry is that the black hole still has that singularity of space time at its core. And Penrose continued to worry about this problem and said, well, it's OK. The singularity is inside the horizon. And if you go inside the horizon, you can't come back. So we can never see the singularity. We who are outside will never see it. So it's not going to affect the laws of physics outside. Probably it messes up the laws of physics inside, but who cares? We are not going in and anyone who did go in can't come back and complain about it. So it, cosmic censorship that somehow the structure of relativity uh, covers singularities and prevents them from being visible to us. Later, a year later, Hawking and Penrose joined forces. Hawking was more interested in cosmology. Penrose was more interested in collapse. But they gave a general theory of singularities that applied to both collapse and cosmology. That was a very beautiful and very important result by both of them jointly. I'll come back to it. Now, that was a stunning piece of mathematics from 1965 by Penrose alone. And 50 to 55 years after his work, black holes have gone from being a mathematical curiosity to the most common objects in the universe. There are estimated to be at least 100 billion supermassive black holes, each with a mass of a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. And this is reality. It's no more fiction. It, they're being studied and seen every single day. There are also stellar mass and intermediate mass black holes, which can have masses of few times the mass of the sun or 50 times, 100 times. And LIGO keeps observing these mergers. The first one was a sensation because that was again a reality for these intermediate mass black holes, which had masses like 50 to 60 times the mass of the sun. And they're just everywhere. And as you, I'm sure you know, the Nobel Prize this year went to Roger Penrose for the theory and Gez and Genzel uh, for the experiment in discovering the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. One of these um, uh, 100 billions of supermassive black holes. And here's the Nobel Prize picture. Very good. Now I'll, uh, I, it's 6.02, so I'll conclude in three, four minutes with just a few thoughts on this. So these are sort of my thoughts. They're not very deep, I think, but I'd still like to say them. Physics is not just a directory of objects and behaviors, but an organized and highly universal structure. It's very special to physics, as I'll argue. The fundamental interactions, electromagnetism, weak interactions, strong interactions and gravity, as far as we know, behave the same in all parts of the universe. And they are all described by highly mathematical theories in the first three cases by gauge theory and in the fourth case by general relativity, which have very, very subtle symmetry principles and a very deep mathematical structure which interfaces with things that were known before in mathematics and adds new things to them. Things like fiber bundles, things like pseudo Riemannian space times. Now, Wigner marveled at the fact that mathematical thinking plays a sovereign role in physics, and I believe he was completely right to do so. My own feeling is there is a set of universal laws of physics of which the standard model and general relativity are special cases and maybe approximate. There's something bigger than both of these. Now, because both of these are based on very deep symmetry principles, the bigger universal theory should be also based on some as yet unknown symmetry principles and through symmetry, the mathematical structure comes in. Now you can give these various names. You can call these universal laws unified theory or final theory or string theory because that's one possible candidate. But since we are not sure and I'm not going to talk about the details of such a theory in this talk, let's just call them universal laws. Although Weinberg called it final theory. 
people get very annoyed with use of words like final and ultimate but you know ultimately history will tell whether there is or there isn't such a thing for me this i believe this because this fact that mathematics keeps working in in physics indicates something deeper than what we know and it seems that nature's own template for physical reality should be based on these laws and phrased in the language of mathematics now it's too outrageous for me to talk about what language nature uses because nature is just something that's there i'm just a part of it but in some intrinsic sense for these laws to be consistent to hold together to really work to apply they must be mathematical laws now typically such laws would have a wide applicability and so the part of my talk i skipped i had briefly mentioned that there's something called higgs mechanism in particle physics there's also an anderson mechanism in condensed matter physics and these are the same mechanism actually anderson found his mechanism before higgs this one works in materials like superconductors this one works in particle physics particles that are created in colliders okay but it's the same mechanism so you see the universality of the law working here now sometimes the law that we think of doesn't have the application we thought so axioms may not have their application in nature they may also or they may not as particles majorana fermions may not exist as elementary particles but now we are pretty sure that both of these exist in materials so the application can be different from what you expected so this perspective says that research on the universal laws can be more effective than the in the long run than research targeted on a specific, specific physics problem now i am not arguing against research targeted on specific problems it's extremely important but we should keep in mind the kind of impact uh, in the long run that research on universal laws or fundamental laws of physics can have and in this sense i'd like to give you a little analogy it's only an analogy uh, you know that in the beginning of the 20th century von roentgen discovered x rays and he ended up doing more for medicine than all the medical researchers of his time put together they were busy working on how to get a bullet out of the body of a soldier but he discovered something which could see through the body of a soldier and tell you exactly where the bullet was which nobody knew until that time it's a whole other story and a very fascinating one now there's a small puzzle which i haven't been able to resolve and it's still there in my mind for complex systems fundamental laws do not necessarily tell us how they behave for systems which are like materials and anderson uh, who's now passed away recently uh, pointed this out repeatedly and wrote a book called more and different he also wrote an essay called more is different saying that uh, a material is not just the sum of the particles it contains there's no way you can get the physics of a uh of a gas or a semiconductor or a metal just by knowing about its individual electrons there's a deeper law for the combined for the collective thing and these are emergent laws now sometimes these emergent laws turn out to be uh universal like bcs theory of superconductivity or these axions in topological insulators but maybe not always and so for complex systems it's not clear how universal the laws are and in biological systems it's not clear that the laws use the language of mathematics in an essential sense people who do mathematical biology as far as i understand i hope i'm not wrong do more modeling of systems rather than make deep mathematical laws which universally apply across biological systems and so i can't resist showing you this quote from a russian mathematician a legendary one israel gel fund uh it's it's tough to read but i i'll just read the last sentence there is only one thing which is more unreasonable than the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics and this is the unreasonable ineffectiveness of mathematics in biology i think that's very cute uh mathematics doesn't seem to have biology doesn't seem to be written in that language it could be that we just don't know it could be the next century a biology will will reveal that it could be that biology has to be just done in a different way as it's done today okay now uh, one last comment i'm 5 minutes over time so i hope that's okay um wigner's observations about the importance of mathematics are very often ignored and i did this little i had this little thought recently 
would penrose of the 1960s get a faculty position in india and this is what i think would happen mathematics departments would say that well he has done some work on matrix inverse and some triangles and all that but it's recreational mathematics but most of his papers are in physics so we don't want him you take him in your physics department and physics departments will say that well he has done work on black holes but that's only mathematics and by the way only mathematics it should shock you it's a shocking term but it's a term that's actually been used in my presence to describe people's research that it's only mathematics okay so they would say well this is about something but it's not real black holes come on when black holes are discovered then we'll take him of course by that time penrose has a nobel prize and he's not interested in your job so it is just a, a kind of fictional story but i just want you people especially you young people to think about it because ignorance really hurts the progress of science and this is based on ignorance about the history which i have recounted here and i keep trying to recount it wherever i get a chance in fact there's a little there's a little story of an actual person ak rai choudhury professor ak rai choudhury late now who himself was a legendary relativist whose work played a crucial role in this hawking penrose theorems of 1970 uh, and this is what has been written about him when he was a young researcher general relativity in kolkata general relativity was not considered worthy of attention of a young researcher and he was asked to work on electron energy bands in metals he had to write two papers in this subject just to keep his job at iacs the institute for cultivation of science had he met with encouragement and appreciation in his early research career things would have certainly been different even now his contribution to hawking penrose work is seen as legendary but it's uh who knows he could have done that work he could have come up with similar results or even before them uh because he was a brilliant person and he was actually uh, uh snubbed for his interest in general relativity because people thought that's just some mathematics which they don't understand okay still let's take comfort in the fact that mathematical approach to physical reality does work i've shown you many examples and in the long run we are scientists we have to accept that fact I'll end with a couple of quotes by people uh, who I respect a lot. Uh, Edward Witten, physics is about concepts, wanting to understand the concepts, the principles by which the world works. David Gross, people, children want to know what we are made of, how it works and why the universe is the way it is. I love this his use of the word children here. And Hawking, of course, our goal is nothing less than a complete description of the universe we live in. So with that, I'll end and thank you very much. Yes. So we have a few questions. Please. I'm curious as to how does Chandrasekhar's work on the mass limit for stellar evolution evolution tie in with work work of Penrose? Was he considering only spherical stars during his work on Chandrasekhar limit? This I actually cannot answer right now um, because I don't remember. Um. Um. a good question i uh, I, i can actually I, i can actually try to answer it right now if i unshare my screen so that now i think you can anyway uh, see me instead of the screen let me uh, let me take a quick look and at least see one thing does penrose uh, in his first paper even cite chandrashekhar's work his motivation certainly had to do with um, uh, collab uh, collapsing stars but indeed there is no mention in his first paper of chandrashekhar at all uh now certainly it's true that some stars don't collapse some stars do collapse and that has to do with chandrashekhar's work but um, uh, i think penrose was more interested in the question that if this is my reading of it could be inaccurate that if a star starts to collapse is there some point beyond which the collapse becomes inevitable and that is the main point that he uh, tried to argue and it is there where violation of spherical symmetry ah very good in his 1969 review he finally mentions chandrashekhar i think this is for the first time uh, and then also oppenheimer volkov 1969 he wrote a much longer paper which is the long version of his 1965 paper what he was doing for four years i don't know but uh, it took a while to write this longer paper which is not that long it's 25 pages but the original was only 3 pages 
and um, he says that many stars have masses larger than the sun so it's unlikely that they can fall below the limit chandrasekhar limit for a stable uh, white dwarf uh, we are thus driven to consider the consequences of a situation in which a star collapses right down to a state where the effects of general relativity become so important that they eventually dominate over all the other forces so yeah i'll invite you to read penrose's 1969 paper it was republished in general relativity and gravitation in 2002 and it's freely available on the net sorry i don't have a more detailed answer someone is asking can you talk a bit more about mahavrana states in detected and topological materials not really i mean the idea the the only thing i understand about it is that you know intrinsically a fermion uh, is described by a complex wave function which has a complex conjugate which describes the antiparticle in some language and even in topological materials there is a complex complex is the same as particle being different from antiparticle but what happens is that some combination of it stays in one place in the topology on the surface and some other combination goes somewhere else so uh, they get delocalized so and what you see in one region is just a majorana fermion and then there's another copy of it somewhere else that's the best i can tell you i've heard a lot of seminars about this but i cannot uh, give you a you know insiders information because i don't really work on this area but it's one of the miracles it's you know it doesn't in one way there's no great surprise in materials you can have all kinds of excitations which are not the fundamental things which the material is made of all materials are made of only electrons protons and neutrons but the effective excitations which govern the behavior of the material are something else and topological uh, insulators have special surface states which uh, can under very difficult conditions i should say uh unambiguously resemble majorana fermions uh, it took a lot of work to do this because i think previous discoveries were criticized for the fact that well what you are seeing in your experiment may be majorana fermions or it may be something else so the authors of this 2018 study basically say that look we really have evidence that this is majorana fermions there were a couple of questions about matter and antimatter symmetry and one yeah. of them is expressing is your thoughts on it mm -hmm. uh, can this be explained by considering the energy of vacuum getting distributed in rest of the universe's dark energy each getting some h amount and is more towards the end no no yeah you know the vacuum has a certain energy okay that's dark energy particles have additional energy over that and all particles i may emphasize have positive energy okay so dark energy is a different problem because dark energy uh, is the energy of the empty universe if the universe had no particles it would still have dark energy now over that there are particles and there are antiparticles both of them have positive energy you should not think that because dirac found negative energy states therefore positrons have negative energy positrons have absolutely positive energy you can smash them into something and they will break it up just like electrons but their interactions are different because they have opposite charge and opposite particle number so i would say that particles themselves don't tell us what is dark energy or explain dark energy because dark energy is the energy in the absence of particles very important to realize that so do you think if we get a final theory some day will it hmm. just explain unification of all four fundamental forces or will it also explain the emergent laws in all the complex systems that we observe so uh, certainly anderson has argued very persuasively that even if you get this theory which he didn't care about apparently it won't explain anything about complex systems and he may be right i would grant that he may be right uh, it seems to me that uh, physics um, there's the physics of fundamental things which is mainly you know the way space time works or the way particles work and then there's the physics of uh, large 
objects which are again complex and then uh, after that comes biology which is the physics of complex living matter okay now it somehow there seems to be some transition there where on the most fundamental side and i don't say most fundamental is good or bad or anything it's just most fundamental there these mathematical laws work extremely well i mean there are so many reasons to argue that the mathematical nature of the laws is really the thing behind everything but the more you get into complex systems you may get into soft matter you may get into considering uh, active matter uh, matter that propels itself uh, you may talk about molecular motors you can talk about all kinds of complicated phenomena in physics and chemistry but so far there's no good mathematical theory and that's also why those fields don't appeal to me personally personally i emphasize because this is what i think i understand and it's what i think i'm reasonably good at understanding and when you go further then you reach biology where which is again you know it's soft it's uh, soft matter but it's also living so you know the more you go in that direction the less mathematics seems to play a role and whether some universal laws will explain that i don't know but it's hard to it's hard to think that they would but you know um, uh, this is we are talking about maybe what might be done 50 or 100 years from now when none of us will be around and you know how do we know people in the 19th century could have not imagined <coughs> what kind of theory and experiment came in the 20th so we are limited by our very uh, you know relatively small lifespan compared with the way science progresses there are a couple of general questions mm -hmm. uh, one of them asks can you suggest some materials to learn about uh, gelman's work yeah yeah sure uh, so gel you know you should just uh, google uh, gelman and you will get the materials uh, but uh, you know the eight for in particular google gelman and eight fold way and there are plenty of review articles it's described in uh, essentially all basic particle physics books in the first chapter itself so um, yeah if you want a concrete reference at this moment i don't have it on my fingertips but uh, uh, there's griffiths there's a textbook of, on particle physics by griffiths which is generally considered the first uh, textbook on the subject for courses and uh, that textbook i think it is in the first or second chapter i uh, i went through a little bit more detail including the original papers to prove my point of how much the theoretical ideas and the thinking and the mathematics influenced the the understanding of gelman and influenced future experiments and it was my focus was on how mathematics can predict experiments by the way it doesn't always do that i mean uh, what is a miracle is that sometimes mathematics alone tells us what nature should do so i was really highlighting that books may not highlight that so that's just something i like to talk about uh, what level of mathematics is required if one aspires to be a successful theoretical physicist yeah i thank you i get asked that question every single day in iser and my answer is consistently the same it's a very funny thing people think that well for this you need to be a deep mathematician uh, who understands mathematics really well like a mathematician i believe that's not necessarily so the only area where really uh, very deep mathematics you need to know it well i would say is general relativity but even then you won't learn that mathematics from uh, uh, any mathematics course because no mathematics department usually teaches courses on pseudo riemannian manifolds they teach courses on differential geometry they teach courses on topology all of these are useful and very good but the fact that you need to know something particular it's very special to the field so what a theoretical physicist does and i suspect gelman did that you just should be quick at picking up the basics of any mathematics which you might need tomorrow so gelman probably i'm i'm guessing probably had attended some lectures or read some things about grouly groups in a very distant way and he started thinking that you know groups are the language to classify particles so let me read more and being a super smart guy he figured it out and then he used it 
no no mathematics training would have prepared him to know group theory and topology and differential geometry and so many other things uh, because in that much time he could not have gotten a physics degree so i tell people you need you know basic mathematics is good but uh, you need to understand the culture of mathematics more than actually trying to become deep in all mathematics before you do physics this is why in england uh, mathematics departments have physicists because they feel that the mathematics which mathematical physicists do is an important branch of mathematics but nowhere else in the world not not in america very much not in india at all does any mathematics department take physics very seriously in fact a lot of mathematics departments that i've known are quite actively hostile to physics so so physicists have to work it out for themselves we have a different goal after all so maybe they are right to be hostile i don't know Thank you, sir. I think that's all for today. I request Abhip sir to give word of thanks. All right. Uh, first of all, we would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Professor Sunil Mukhi for accepting our invitation and for giving this very fascinating talk Thank on you. the history, the background, and the beauty of mathematical physics and how it gives us insights into the experimental observations and a starting point for that. So, thank you, sir. Um, we would also like to thank the Dean of the IAC UG pro program and Professor P.S. Anil Kumar for making this talk possible. You will find this talk and other talks on the Pravega YouTube channel. Um, and for upcoming talks and events, you can che check the Pravega website. Lastly, we would like to thank you, the audience, for attending the talk, and we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe and goodbye. Bye.